Lies of P is a Souls-like released in September of 2023, developed by up-and-coming Korean game studio NeoWiz. It's a dark retelling of Pinocchio in a gothic clockwork punk setting, with some borderline Lovecraftian horror elements for good measure, because why not? Lies of P is the first game of its kind that NeoWiz has ever produced, with the majority of their library consisting of mobile games and 2D titles developed by their subsidiaries. How did that experience translate into a gritty, fantastical Souls-like? Well, let's get into it. There's a solid amount of playstyle variety in the game thanks to all the weapons behaving differently, which will be explained much more in the mechanics section. This puts the player in a mindset where every single time you find a chest, it's exciting, as it may become a significant upgrade, or it may provide an entirely new field of combat that might suit you better. And speaking of chests, there are rewards everywhere, and exploring off the beaten path or behind enemy lines almost always yields something. Even when that something may not be useful based on your playstyle, being able to sell it for ergo will stack up for leveling, which will inevitably become useful in the endgame or against that boss that is walling you out. The game also launched with great replayability thanks to a proper New Game Plus, wherein your upgrades, cosmetics, and equipment all carry over. New Game Plus in Lies of P will also change the dialogue that you get from bosses, which expands on the story in ways that would have been very spoiler-heavy if you didn't already know the game's twists and turns. For a difficult game, difficulty scaling is very important, and so I judged Lies of P on that fairly critically, and it does it well. At no point in my playthrough did I hit a difficulty spike that ever felt entirely unfair. More so, I felt that any difficulty spike stemmed from my playstyle being a bad match for a given boss. Some bosses you can beat very soundly with a bait and punish heavy playstyle, while others have long strings of quick attacks that prevent you from capitalizing with a slow weapon if you are anything less than perfect. Fortunately, as mentioned before, the game provides many options in terms of weapons and playstyles, and as long as you are willing to look, it also showers you in the necessary upgrades for the three or four weapons that are going to end up working best for you. The vast majority of the game takes place in the city of Krat, but also expands into four other areas outside of the city proper. Old Krat, or Original Krat, where you'll find the remains of the first original village town before it migrated and expanded to where it is now thanks to Elysian Boulevard. The Alchemist's Abbey, an island off the coast where the Alchemist faction has made their refuge. The Dumping Grounds, where all of the discarded or broken puppets are illegally disposed of. And the Cathedral of St. Frangelico, which overlooks the city and gave sanctuary to all of the ailing citizens of Krat during the crisis. Each of these areas are varied in terms of what kinds of enemies you will face. The city's streets are full of maids and butlers, the train station has attendants and police, the opera house is full of performers, and even the handful of normal humans make some level of sense in the context in which you fight them. A coward who ran from the danger that was facing his group, a doctor driven mad by the insanity of his circumstances, a gang who is capitalizing on all the chaos to dominate those who are left. They all populate the world and help to make an utterly desecrated place still feel lived in. The world of Lies of P thrives most based upon its interconnectivity. It isn't truly an open world game. There are very clearly defined biomes and different sections of the city which look and feel different from one another, but everything is interwoven to make traversal both feel more rewarding and efficient with time. By the nature of this game as a Souls-like, the game is very punishing, and death is a likelihood. By virtue of that, you are going to be respawning at your last Stargazer fairly often. Yet despite there not being a huge number of them, the distance between visits never ends up feeling like a slog. This is because as you explore, you will drop ladders, unlock doors, and otherwise find shortcuts and passageways which will loop back in on themselves, connecting the latest areas you've just explored back to the earliest. This is why areas like the Malam District can get away with using only a single checkpoint, as the last area before the boss is inside the... Red Lobster? They have a Red Lobster? Anyway, it's right next to the Stargazer you're fine when you enter the area. 
With regard to glitches, there really isn't a lot to report on with Lies of P, which is a good thing. I never experienced any freezing or crashes in my playthrough, although I know some people must have on launch because it was part of the patch notes on Steam. Although I will note that I was playing this game on launch day and hadn't experienced anything myself. This one enemy clipped into the ground this one time, but that was it for that. Meanwhile, there were no obvious glitches that could really be exploited, save for some level design oriented pathfinding issues. For example, this guy is too tall to fit under certain passages or objects in the world, so if I hooked a hard right under this pipe, he would keep running after me without being able to actually fit, and the same goes for this wooden post. Those are all, for the most part, singular instances though, so they aren't really going to affect the score. What will, however, is by far the most significant thing to talk about in this very short section, frame stuttering. It isn't frequent, but the problem is, the frames only ever locked up when it mattered. During boss fights. Occasionally, the screen would just freeze up for maybe a quarter of a second, but in a game that encourages parrying on a frame-oriented basis, losing 20 frames can become a very significant problem if it occurs when you're getting attacked. Hey there. Thanks for watching this far into the video. Subscribe if you want to support me making this kind of content. Don't listen to strangers who tell you to lie to people. And of course, who are spoilers from this point forward. Lies of P is a bit of a misleading name. Clearly, this is a loose retelling of Pinocchio, what with the puppets and lying thing, but your character is never technically named. Although as the story unfolds and mysteries unravel, the truth about your past and purpose becomes painfully clear. You awaken thanks to an ergo butterfly, and hear a woman's voice beckoning to you. You arm yourself and find that the city of Krat has been overwhelmed by both war and plague. Ever since ergo was discovered as a power source, the art of puppetry moved from its classical roots to having fully automated servants, entertainers, and security powered by the miracle of ergo. These puppets revolted under mysterious circumstances and in defiance of the four laws of the Grand Covenant which bound them to their servitude. In the ensuing massacre, the event became known as the Puppet Frenzy. Meanwhile, those who survived the frenzy were afflicted with a horrible illness known as the Petrification Disease, the symptoms of which truly speak for its name. After arriving at Hotel Krat, you need to lie in order to enter. You claim to be human, and this automatically sets you apart as a puppet which can violate the Grand Covenant. Fourth law, a puppet cannot lie. Once inside, you'll meet various characters, including Sophia, the woman whose voice called you out of your slumber. You are sent by her to find your father, and indeed the grandfather of all puppets, Geppetto who is being hunted in the streets. After saving him, as well as the enterprising puppet inventor Venini, a twisting plot begins to unfold once you find the shambling corpses of the plague victims assailing Krat's cathedral. Each attempt to resolve either the ongoing war or plague is revealed to solve a symptom rather than the root cause. All the while, the alchemists, a faction of experimental scientists and chemists, seemingly not only produce a cure for the petrification disease, but also a way to revive the dead better and stronger than before. Although their motives, as well as the purpose and origin of the disease and the puppet frenzy, are not as clear as they may seem. All of this being underpinned by a faction war between the stalker clans, the discovery of puppets who have awakened a personality without going insane, Geppetto and Vanini's personal motivations, the true identity of Sophia, and the mad leader of the alchemists manipulating the organization along with the corrupted archpriest of the church in an attempt to become the reincarnation of God. See, I know this game is Korean, but it absolutely has some of that JRPG insanity in it. Despite how wild the story that I just described sounds, the plot of Lies of P is surprisingly easy to follow as time goes on, which is refreshing for a game in this genre. Dedicated players are still given the opportunity to dig around and uncover more discreet lore about what's going on, but not without giving everyone all of the necessary information to follow what's happening on the critical path alone. This creates a story with the depth of many Souls-like games without ever putting the player in a position where they have to question why they're doing what they're doing as long as they're paying attention. All of this is well and good until we start looking at the game's themes. 
The consequences of lying and the nature of what it means to be human are core themes taken from the story of Pinocchio, which Lies of P entirely fumbles. For the sake of context, I intentionally played the game as an almost 100% lie run. In almost literally every opportunity, save for two or three that I can remember, I intentionally made sure to lie, even if it's not what I wanted to say, or if there wasn't a good reason for it. However, the fact remains that 90% of the time, lying is almost always put forth as the best option contextually. Telling people what they want to hear or obscuring yourself from guilt ensures that people are given happiness and hope while also believing that you are nothing but the kindest of soulless machines. All the while, lying also advances your progression towards becoming a real human being, with the messages following your lies advancing from your springs are reacting or the ergo is whispering to you feel warmth and your heart is beating. There are even Easter eggs which act as indicators of your humanity, which I will briefly touch on in the following sections, but they only advance as a result of your lying. Lying is also put forth as a uniquely human action. Puppets are forbidden from lying in this weird amended version of Asimov's Three Laws of Robotics via the Fourth Law. This automatically sets puppets and humans apart by the trait that humans can lie while puppets cannot. Bolstering this is the narrative that lying is a weapon and tool used uniquely by humans and furthermore, multiple allied characters who aren't shown to be bad people directly encourage you to lie to people. And the unfortunate climax to this point that I've been getting to is that there are virtually no consequences for being a pathological liar whatsoever. Lying almost always leads to people being happier, thinking more of you, and mechanically rewarding you by giving you more items. On top of the fact that lying seems to be the near singular factor which determines your humanity, lying is being put forth not only as the best option for almost every circumstance, but also as the human default. And somehow much worse, you also get actively punished for trusting people. Almost every character that you meet outside of the hotel will invariably betray you, kidnap the people you care about, trash your home, or manipulate you into getting what they want. Ultimately, what this results in is the moral of the story being that lying is always good and defines who you are as human, and trusting people other than yourself is almost always bad. Either this game is incredibly incompetent with its themes and has no idea how to get its point across, or it is incredibly jaded and cynical, and the lesson that it wants you to take away is an absolutely god-awful way to be a human being. The first thing that I want to address is something that doesn't quite fit anywhere else in this section. There are two Easter eggs that can be used as a litmus test for how human you've become. The mechanical one is the pet cat that hangs around the hotel. If you're more puppet than human, the cat will hate you and hisses at you if you try to pet it. If you're human, however, the cat not only doesn't dislike you, but will let you pick it up and play with it for a minute. Moving on from that to the meat of this, Lies of P doesn't bring a lot of new ideas to the table mechanically. Almost all of the real creativity is in the setting and the enemy designs. What it did do, however, is look at all of the contemporaries that it wanted to be like, and then carefully curated mechanics from each of them. In this way, Lies of P acts less like a game that's trying to reinvent what a Souls-like can do, like for example what Hollow Knight does, and instead positions itself like a love letter to From Software. It takes mechanics from the Dark Souls series, Bloodborne, and Sekiro, and combines them in ways that FromSoft never has. Well, more Bloodborne and Sekiro, since they're both pulling from Dark Souls already, but I digress. Let's go through each of the borrowed mechanics and talk about how they were implemented and changed. Being a Souls-like, it has all the staples required to mimic Dark Souls. 
Souls are Ergo, Bonfires are Stargazers, you have a special soft-spoken female NPC with a bunch of lore implications who acts as your level-up system, you lose all of your Ergo on death in a way that allows you to go back and pick it up, etc, etc. From Bloodborne, it borrows the aggressive playstyle with an emphasis on dodging and parrying rather than blocking. And from Sekiro, it partially borrows the stance parry system, wherein after landing enough successful parries or hits, your enemy will be left in a vulnerable state for a special hit that deals a ton of damage. Also, Lies of P borrows the whole prosthetic left arm with superpowers thing outright. And the first ability is also mostly the same, the ability to grapple onto things. For Dark Souls, the mechanics are both made to be easier and more difficult. After you respawn, you'll have a counter of how much ergo is lingering out in the world for you to get. And the reason they give you this convenient little HUD element is because every hit you take reduces the amount that's left. So in order for you to regain whatever ergo you lost on your last death, you will need to make a hitless run back to where you died. On the other hand, Lies of P is much much more forgiving when it comes to potentially stealing that resource away from you in any unfair way. Boss rooms tend to be fairly obvious, but even if you do wander in and die with a ton of ergo on you, your death ergo will actually spawn outside the boss arena, allowing you to go grab it and potentially level up with what you had before you go in and try again. This also prevents any unfortunate situations where you'll die on the opposite end of the boss room from where you enter, and then die again before you can grab it, losing everything. From Bloodborne, the mechanics are more forgiving, and playstyle is more so what's taken. Blocking is more or less a non-option. You can, but it is always your least best option. It's better than getting hit outright, but it is worse than either of your other defensive options, both of which are more difficult. This is because there is no weapon in the game which will allow you to block 100% of any given damage type. So you will always take chip damage that'll eventually kill you if all you do is block. Thus, you're encouraged to always be on the move, time your dodge as well, and gain the muscle memory necessary for parrying. Although parrying works much more like it does in Sekiro, so we'll get to that. Also from Bloodborne, Lies of P restores your resources when you successfully fall into that aggressive playstyle. Although where Bloodborne only restores select resources on select types of hits, Lies of P will restore your healing item progressively with each hit after you've used all of them. So even if you're pushed to the edge and burn through all of your heals, you can keep getting a single one back if you play your life out and don't die in the meantime while you're landing hits. Likewise, dealing damage also charges your Fable Gauge, which is used to activate your weapon's unique abilities. This functions in a remarkably similar way to the ATB Gauge from Final Fantasy VII Remake. For those who have played that game or have seen my review on it, you'll understand how this works. Okay, this is an addendum now that the whole video is coming together. I came to understand something while I was watching footage that is huge to the whole Bloodborne aggressive playstyle thing. Forgive the fact that I'm basically ad-libbing this, but I think it's important enough to throw in. There's a stat that I think is called Guard Regen. I never knew what it meant or what it did for the entire game. Now I think I get it. If you've ever played a fighting game and you have temporary or blue health, it's that. If you get hit while guarding, you'll have temporary health that you can now regen, but the way you regen it directly feeds into Bloodborne's playstyle. If you have temporary health, you regenerate it by landing hits or parrying, so you are not only de-incentivized from using the easiest defensive option in the form of blocking because you still take damage, but you are actively healed and kept in the fight longer for putting yourself at risk and playing more aggressively and only ever attempting to parry. Sekiro's mechanics are actually made harder, as enemies in this game also have the equivalent to perilous attacks, except in Lies of P, the red glowing attacks from enemies are not only unblockable, they're also undodgeable. They will ignore the invincibility of your dodge animations if you connect with them, meaning that your only options are to parry or to not be anywhere near them to begin with. The rest of the mechanics are more so diluted so that it would fit into a more traditional Souls-like formula, so instead of the stance breaking leading to the destruction of an entire health bar, it just does the equivalent of a backstab. 
I can't call it a crit because that's still technically its own thing, but I also can't call it what it is called in this game, a fatal attack because the attack isn't literally guaranteed to be fatal, and calling it that is going to make people think that it works exactly in the same as Sekiro when it doesn't. Clarification aside, all of these mechanics are reworked or tweaked from their original inspiring game to make them behave just different enough that players familiar with the originals may notice and feel at home without it behaving exactly the same and becoming monotonous or boring. Not to mention that since this is the first time they've all been combined this way to my knowledge, it also creates a unique gameplay experience from the inspiring material. And now that the section has gone on far too long, let's blaze through what the game does that's original, which further sets it apart. The most important thing is the weapon system that I've mentioned multiple times up to this point. Every single weapon, except for boss weapons, is comprised of a blade and a handle. These blades and handles can be mixed and matched in any way you see fit to match your playstyle. The blade tends to affect how quickly the weapon can be swung, while the handle determines how the weapon is swung. Each part also has a unique ability that utilizes the Fable Gauge that I mentioned earlier. This leads to all kinds of decision making for finding a playstyle that suits you. Maybe a given combo has all the abilities that you want, but the weapons don't handle the way you want or vice versa. Or maybe you get the weapon that does both, but both of your Fable Arts will now cost so much meter that it doesn't even matter because you'll almost never use them. In addition to this, some weapon parts actually have unique characteristics aside from what I've mentioned. The one that I'll highlight as an example is what became my personal Old Faithful, the Booster Glaive Handle. The Booster Glaive Handle has a unique ability to build up pressure as you charge up your strong attack, which then boosts you forward toward the enemy when you release it. This filled in a gap for me where I needed a weapon that could strike more quickly than my Holy Sword boss weapon, while also not sacrificing how far away that I could technically land a hit from. Lastly, some weapons can use their Fable Arts to transform from one form into another- ah, That's just Bloodborne again. Look at you, you incorrigible Lovecraftian scamp. I want to start this section off by highlighting the biggest negative. In general, the game does look great in terms of its visual fidelity and attention to detail, and as much as I want to give my usual checklist of great use of lighting to guide the player this, or unique visual indicators that inform the player that, I'm going to spend the time I would talk about those talking about this. Characters, outside of cutscenes, just don't talk right? For some reason, whenever a character is in dialogue, their mouths will move completely out of sync with whatever it is they're saying. It isn't like it is in older RPGs where their mouths will just open and shut at a consistent pace to represent that they're the ones talking without actually matching anything. Their mouths open and shut irregularly as though they're meant to be speaking real words in a real sentence. So either it is just supposed to be symbolic like older RPGs and it just isn't goofy enough to make it obvious, or it is trying to be realistic, and it just looks incredibly janky and wrong. Even when I change the language to Korean, it doesn't change how the dialogue syncs up, because all the lines are still read in English. And speaking of dialogue, I want to address the visual design element that acts as the other humanity litmus test. After defeating the Black Rabbit Brotherhood, you can find a painting of a boy in their hideout. A painting of a boy who just so happens to look exactly like you, which belong to Geppetto. Bring it back to him and he will hang it on the wall, explaining that he once commissioned the eccentric artist D. Gray to paint it for him. The painting's nose changes in the way that the original Pinocchio puppets did, with its nose growing instead of yours when you lie. This also oddly confirms that Dorian Gray, the man who gained immortality by placing his soul in a painting, canonically exists in the Lies of P universe, and all of his paintings apparently seem to work the same way, taking a portion of the subject's essence into themselves and then changing appropriately in place of that subject. The music, in terms of audio design, actually has serious narrative implications, along with a visual detail during boss fights regarding dialogue. A slightly unusually stronger spoiler warning until the subjective section, since I am going to hop back into some story details to dissect how well this game uses alternative storytelling methods. 
During boss fights with puppets, and in select other circumstances, they'll say things that you, the human playing the game, can't understand. Your character also struggles to understand them for most of the game, and so the subtitles will be this blurred out non-language. However, upon a second playthrough and your character's awakening at the end of the game, he can now understand what they're saying. The subtitles will ultimately reflect back on the Puppet King as actually being your childhood friend Romeo, trying to reach out to who he thinks is Carlo, the human boy your puppet was modeled after, whose soul resides in your heart. This ties into the boss music when you fight Romeo. You fight him in a grand opera hall, and the theme music Stage of Grief plays. This is both a pun on the fact that it's taking place in a performance hall, and a play on words for the five stages of grief a human experiences when coping with the loss of death. This shows Romeo as also having been awoken to something resembling human, as he has great grief in fighting Carlo, and all of this is tied together as the answer for why Romeo shakes his head in sadness whenever he kills you, even if you can't understand what he's saying. All of these details show that the Puppet King was never evil nor truly the villain of the story, and tells its own story of a puppet turned person, desperate and heartbroken, trying everything in their power to save their friend from the true master that's always been pulling their strings. First law, all puppets must obey the creator's commands. Law Zero, the creator's name is Geppetto, Giuseppe Geppetto. Remember, we're best friends. I'm Romeo. Dude, Lies of P goes so hard. I was looking forward to this game, and I was still pleasantly surprised almost every step of the way. It even got me to invert my usual Soulsborne gameplay. Almost 100% of the time, in every game, I'll do some kind of dex, debuff, bleed, whatever, katana build before transitioning to a magic or faith strength build in the end game. This time, it was exactly the opposite, and I had so much more fun because of it. Originally, my old faithful was the Booster Glaive Great Sword on the Police Baton Handle. Then I stepped up massively in size and damage to the Holy Sword Boss Weapon Great Sword before being pushed to a faster weapon and rebuilding entirely into technique with the Booster Glaive Handle for a good chunk of the game and then finally landing on the weapon that my filthy katana-wielding heart was destined for. Essentially, what happened was that I just got skill-checked out of my big sword with big number go playstyle when I realized I couldn't parry for garbage and I kept running into bosses that required you to parry because they had undodgeable stuff. And what I landed on because of that was a super high skill ceiling weapon that forced me to get really good. This meant that I would basically get curb stomped by every boss until I memorized everything and got in the zone. And when I got in the zone, <laughs> 10 out of 10 opinion score practically on gameplay alone. This game is sick. I was actually going to give it like an eight at one point, but as I was writing this, I realized how giddy thinking about this game made me feel. And if that feeling doesn't make it a 10 out of 10 opinion, I don't know what does. If you can't tell, I love a good power trip. It might be my favorite feeling, but only if it's earned. This is one of the very few games where when I finished it, I felt godlike. I was ecstatic. I couldn't contain myself. I even DM'd a friend at 2 a.m. because I couldn't contain just how hyped I was about how sick the final bosses went. And all of that isn't because the game makes you overpowered by the end, it's because it gives you the tools to potentially make yourself overpowered based on your skill alone. If I screw up, I die in like two and a half hits. If I nail it, I'm invincible. 
I know what I just said could generally be true of most Souls games, but if I'm honest, Lies of P is far and away one of the most fun Souls-like games I've ever played. I'm not gonna say it's the best Souls-like game, but it's easily one of the ones I've had the most fun beating. But enough about what I think. Is the game actually good? A few months before this game came out, a viewer told me they were most excited for my review of Lies of P out of every other review I put on the schedule for the rest of the year. The reason being, because this was the only game I said I was looking forward to. So I decided, screw it, you're right, it's the thing I want to talk about, so I'm going to make it my longest review to date. This one's for you, friendo. Until it gets beaten by Baldur's Gate 3. We'll, we'll ignore that. But until then, I've been LonelFX, and I will see you, yes you, next time.